The book of Acts, chapter 25, verse 1, is where we begin our study today. And this is our 20th study in the book of Acts. One more to go after this. Father, we ask that you would add your blessing to the word that we're about to study. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> the, the Apostle Paul has been uh, falsely accused and has been sitting in a Roman jail for over two years because he's not been given justice and a fair trial. He's about to stand trial before a new Roman governor whose name is Festus. And it all came to pass because there were some religious leaders of the Jews who hated Paul because they hated Christianity. Let's begin reading in verse 1. Three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Festus takes over for Felix as Roman governor, and he makes a trip to Jerusalem, which is where the religious leaders were. Verse 2, where the chief priests and the Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. They urgently requested Festus, as a favor to them, to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem, for they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. You see, governors, the Roman governors liked to please the Jewish rulers because they could erupt into riots at any moment. And so the Jews are using whatever leverage they have to try to get Festus to bring Paul to Jerusalem. With Festus as, as the new governor taking over for Felix, they saw an opportunity to send, set up another ambush. But they have to get Festus to move Paul across the country from Caesarea to Jerusalem. He's not cooperating. Instead, he says, I'm going to Paul over there. Verse 4. Festus answered, Paul is being held at Caesarea, and I myself am going there soon. Let some of your leaders come with me and press charges against the man there, if he has done anything wrong. And, uh, in other words, Festus says, you Jews who are accusing Paul, send someone with some authority along with me for the trial, and have it at Caesarea, where Paul has been confined for two years, by the way. Verse 6. After spending eight or ten days with them, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day he convened the court and ordered that Paul be brought before him. Paul's trial begins, and it's all about nothing. He shouldn't even be there. Verse 7. When Paul appeared, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many serious charges against him which they could not prove. So it was totally unfair here. And of course God never promised Paul or us a fair deal in this world. What he did promise is that he would use even the bad things to work together for our spiritual good and to fulfill his purpose. And believe it or not, God is using all this bad that is happening to Paul to bring about some good. And we're going to see some of that good very soon here. Verse 8, Then Paul made his defense. I have done nothing wrong against the law of the Jews, or against the temple, or against Caesar. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? And so, the Roman governor Festus has just arrived to govern the Jews in this area and that Sanhedrin that religious high court of the Jews was here and it would be politically smart to get on their good side and that is what the governor is trying to do at Paul's expense of course how about shipping you back to Jerusalem because he knew that's what the Jews wanted verse 10 Paul answered I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried I have not done any wrong to the Jews, as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. He, has one, he wasn't found guilty of anything. He doesn't plan on being handed over to the Jews. 
And he's getting sick and tired of being a stooge for these Roman governors who were constantly using him as a pawn trying to score points with the Jews. He's not going to do it anymore. 11. Again. He says, If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. Paul wanted a verdict. He wanted justice. There's no way in the world that he wanted to go back to Jerusalem. That would be walking right into the hands of those Jewish vigilantes. 12. After Festus had conferred with his council, he declared, You have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you will go. And as a citizen of Rome, Paul could appeal to Caesar if he felt like he was being treated unfairly. Unfairly is an understatement. Their treatment of Paul was no less than shameful. And now they're talking about moving him back to Jerusalem for trial. Forget it. He appeals to Caesar. Paul's going to Rome, just as Jesus said he would. Verse 13. A few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice. Bernice was Agrippa's sister, known as the queen or as a princess. They arrived at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. Since they were spending many days there, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. He said, There is a man here whom Felix left as a prisoner. When I went to Jerusalem, the chief priest and elders of the Jews brought charges against him and asked that he be condemned. Two years has not diminished the Jews' hatred of Paul or their desire to see him dead. Even after two years of Paul being in jail unfairly, the religious leaders still hate him and still want him dead. There are those who love themselves so much and are so immoral that they refuse to let their hatred of others go, no matter how much those other people may have suffered. Verse 16, I told them, that it is not the Roman custom to hand over any man before he has faced his accusers and he has had an opportunity to defend himself against their charges. So you see, Rome had a pretty good system of justice. But like ours, it sometimes failed as it did in the case of Paul because of the sinners who operated it. 17. When they came here with me, I did not delay the case but convened the court the next day and ordered the man to be brought in. Festus wants the king to know that he did not avoid the Paul issue. He did his job. You know, most Roman governors didn't want to deal with any Jewish issues because, as I said, they could really erupt into a riot if they didn't like something. So, it would have been something to avoid, but he didn't. And it's best not to avoid unpleasant jobs, but just to get at them as soon as possible. 18. When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I had expected. In other words, the governor thought the Jews, thought that the Jews were going to accuse Paul of breaking a Roman law. Instead, it was just about one of their religious laws, and of course, you know, the Romans, they didn't care about the Jewish religious laws. It didn't matter to them. Verse 19, instead, they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus whom Paul claimed was alive. And boy, you can tell that Festus had no interest in spiritual things, certainly no interest in Christianity. He calls Jesus a dead man. And so, he didn't believe that Jesus was alive. He must have thought Paul was out of his mind. You know, preaching a dead man's religion. 20. I was at a loss to investigate on, excuse me, I was at a loss how to investigate such matters, so I asked if he would be willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial there on these charges. When Paul made his appeal to be held over for the emperor's decision, I ordered him and held until I could send him to Caesar. He says the only reason Governor says the only reason Paul is still here, King, is because I'm still making arrangements to send him to Rome. And so Paul is waiting. Paul was waiting to be sent to Rome, 
where he hopefully will get justice just as he had waited two years to be released from this jail waiting for justice he's waiting and he continues to wait and those times of waiting can be very difficult times those times of waiting and maybe being ignored by other people who should not ignore you even those times as trying as they are they are still under the control of God and that is a good thing to remember verse 22 then Agrippa said to Festus I would like to hear this man myself he replied tomorrow you will hear him the next day Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking officers and the leading men of the city at the command of Festus Paul was brought in and so many important people came to see the king and his sister and to watch the court proceedings with Paul this was a fancy get-together and a big show of power for Agrippa 24 Festus said King Agrippa and all who are present with us you see this man the whole Jewish community has petitioned me about him in Jerusalem and here in Caesarea shouting that he ought not to live any longer now Festus has only been in charge for a few days but it didn't take him long to figure out that the Jews hated Paul for whatever reason he couldn't figure out why and wanted him dead they wanted him dead executed the thing is the Jews have not convinced Festus that Paul deserves to die 25 I found he had done nothing deserving of death but because he made his appeal to the Roman or to the Emperor I decided to send him to Rome Festus is defending his decision to send Paul to Caesar rather than turn him over to the Jews see he's still trying to impress the king of the Jews here so-called and the Jewish religious leaders he's saying in essence my you know I can't please you he's, he's trying to save his own neck he's I can't please you I, I've got to obey the Emperor Paul requested it and as a Roman citizen he deserves the right to go to Caesar if he appeals 26 but I have nothing definite to write to his majesty about him therefore I have brought him before all of you and especially before you King Agrippa so that as a result of this investigation I may have something to write for I think it is unreasonable to send on a prisoner without specifying the charges against him in other words the governor says how can I send Paul to Caesar I'm going to because he's appealed but how can I send him to Caesar to be tried when I really haven't heard any charges against the man that would be of any interest to the Emperor I'm just going to be wasting the Emperor's time and it's probably not a very good idea to do that and so the governor is looking for help help me write a letter you know explain the charges against this man and he wants Agrippa to help him with this 26 verse 1 then Agrippa said to Paul you have permission to speak for yourself so Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense King Agrippa I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews and especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies therefore I beg you to listen to me patiently Paul was glad to tell his story to the king and that's because Agrippa understood Roman Jewish relations whereas Festus the governor did not and he hopes at last maybe to get a fair decision from Agrippa maybe he won't even have to go to Caesar verse 4 the Jews all know Paul continues the way I have lived ever since I was a child from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem and Paul is saying I was trained to be a good Jewish boy from the day I was born and all the Jews know that in other words I'm not a hater of the old Jewish religion as they are accusing me just not true check my background verse 5 they have known me for a long time and can testify if they are willing that according to the strictest sect of our religion I lived as a Pharisee in other words Paul is saying if my Jewish persecutors were honest and would admit the truth they would testify that I was always a very strict Jew myself when it comes to Jewish laws and Jewish customs I did not budge one bit 
implication of Paul's words. It would take something big to change me, don't you think? Jesus Christ is something big. And a relationship with Christ changes people. Sometimes 180 degrees like it did with Paul. Verse 6 And now, it is because of my hope in what God has promised our fathers that I am on trial today. Paul was on trial because he was looking forward to the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies God gave concerning the Messiah. That, that is why he is on trial not only because he was looking forward to them but because he was preaching. He was preaching and teaching the fulfillment of all those Old Testament prophecies that all the Jews were waiting to see fulfilled and they were fulfilled in Christ. Paul recognized that all those old prophecies and those messianic times that everybody looked forward to arrived with Jesus Christ. And that's what he taught. But the Jews, they wanted to keep things as they were. See, they didn't want to keep up with God. They wanted their comfortable religion the way it was. You know, they were in charge. They liked it. 7. This is the promise our twelve tribes are hoping to fulfill as they earnestly serve God day and night. O King, it is because of this hope that the Jews are accusing me. Why should any one of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? He says, he says you want to know what my message is? My message is the fulfillment of those Old Testament prophecies is here today. And he says, I can prove it from Scripture too. And Paul always did. And Paul just does not understand why what he is doing for Christ should be such a big deal. Should be such a bad thing to the Jews. What is it about the message of Christ and Christianity that you hate so much? And why? Because you know what? That's true today too. There's absolutely nothing in the correct teaching of Christianity that should possibly upset anyone. What's there to be upset about? That God Almighty Himself came to earth, became a man, suffered humiliation and a horrible death on the cross to pay for our sins that we, so that we don't have to go to hell? That's going to upset you? It doesn't make sense. Or that God offers us complete and total forgiveness of all sins? Total pardon? free of charge in Christ Jesus, that's going to upset you? Or that God tells us to forsake evil? Why would that upset anybody? So what is so bad about the true message of Christianity that people don't accept it? That's Paul's question here. It just amazed them. What do they got to be upset? Why do they want to kill me for this? 9. I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth and that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priest, I put many of the saints in prison, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Paul could identify with the strict Jews who were persecuting him because he used to be one of them. He used to be obsessed with hurting Christians. Now he is obsessed with turning people to Christ, who he knows is the only Savior. 11. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I, notice, tried to force them to blaspheme. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. Paul tried. He would torture Christians to try to get them to curse Christ. But true faith holds up even when facing torture or death for Christ. The Bible says those who endure to the end shall be saved. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priest. About noon, O king, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. When Paul was told by Jesus, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. Actually, and Paul would know this, Jesus was telling Paul that he was acting like a stubborn animal. A stubborn beast of burden. Because back then, back then an animal would 
often kick when it was first hooked up to a plow. So it would rebel. And as a result, the farmer would put a pointed stick right next to the cow's leg. See? And when he kicked, he got poked and it hurt. So eventually, he would stop kicking, stop rebelling, and submit because it was, he was just hurting himself. Now, by persecuting Christians, Paul was certainly hurting those Christians, and he was hurting Jesus, but he was also hurting himself. In fact, those who reject Christ are, prim are primarily hurting themselves. 15. Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. The Lord replied, Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. Paul asked, Who are you, Lord? Who, who are you? And Jesus told him who he was. And then he told him what he wanted him to do, too. He says, You go tell people what happened to you here how I appeared to you. You go tell people what happened to you, who I am, and I'm going to show you more stuff later on, and then you have to tell people about those things also. And that's what God wants us to do. God just wants us to pass on the truth that we know that He has shown us to others. 17. I will rescue you, or I will protect you from your own people and from the Gentiles I am sending you to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and notice, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Jesus promised to protect Paul. Jesus promised to protect him. He says, I have come and I will protect you from your own people and from the Gentiles. That doesn't mean that Paul doesn't have to suffer. It means he will finish God's plan for him. Because God's protection doesn't necessarily mean that we will not suffer. It means that we will complete what he calls us to do. And then, notice 18 again, to open, he's going to send them. Sending Paul to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan to God. So that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Satan rules over everyone who has not received Christ as Lord and Savior. Notice what Jesus said here? I'm going to send you to give them the word of God so that they can be delivered from the power of Satan. Satan rules over everyone who has not received Jesus as Lord and Savior. Whether they know it or not, he does. Someone says, well, I haven't repented. I mean, I haven't received Christ, and I don't believe that I'm under the, the rule of Satan either. Well, you don't believe that, because as Jesus says here, you're spiritually blind. Your eyes have not been opened. That's why you need the Word of God, so that it opens the eye, your eyes to your real situation. 19. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and to the Gentiles also, I preach that they should repent, turn to God, and prove their repentance by their deeds. Paul's message, repent. That better be our message too. Do not listen to the evangelical crowd who say, never ever tell an unsaved person that they need to repent. Where they get that from, I have no idea. Never turn, tell an unsaved person to repent? That's all Paul did. Paul's message, stop doing bad things. Make God the most important thing in your life. That is repentance. And have faith in Jesus. And of course, talk is cheap. Anybody can say that they've repented. The proof is in how they behave and talk and spend their time and spend their money. That's the proof of repentance. And that is what is needed. Verse 21. That is why the Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. Paul was arrested on false charges, which he doesn't even mention here in his defense. Instead, 
He just tells everybody there the real reason why the Jews hated him and hated Christianity and hated Christ and it is because Jesus Christ loves the Gentiles and wants them to be saved as well as the Jews. That is why Paul is being persecuted. And I'll tell you this, a person has way too much hate in them if they want to see a person, anyone, burn in hell. No matter who that person may be. 22. Paul continues, But I have, I have had God's help to this very day, and so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophet said. Moses said what happened, that the Christ would suffer, and as the first to rise from the dead, would proclaim light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I don't know why, I just get the feeling that Paul did not make a good impression on Festus, don't you? You are insane, Paul. Festus thinks Paul is serving a dead man and suffering for a dead man religion. You must believe that because remember he called Jesus a dead man? Felix says, you're insane, Paul. Boy, it's a good thing that God has not commanded his people to impress the world. Or we who teach the word of God would be miserable failures. As the truth sure did not impress Festus. 25. I'm not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. The events of Christ's life and death were not done in secret. Agrippa knew the facts about Jesus. Ignorance was not his problem. His problem was that he never repented and submitted to Christ. And that lack of personal application is enough to damn his soul to hell. 28. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Almost you persuade me to be a Christian. Paul replied, Short time or long, I pray God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become as I am, except for these chains. Paul was their prisoner for over two years, but he did not hate them. He wanted them to have everlasting life through Jesus Christ, just as he did. Two years of unfair treatment was not enough to get someone like Paul who loves Christ to become bitter. Verse 30 The king rose, and with him the governor and Bernice, and those sitting with them. They left the room, and while talking with one another, they said, This man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Someone says, you got to be kidding me. He could have been set free. He could have walked out of this jail, a free man right here, if he had not appealed to Caesar. Someone says, Paul made a big mistake by appealing to Caesar. Maybe. But it's important to remember that God can turn mistakes into opportunities, like he is doing here. An opportunity for Paul to witness to Agrippa, to Festus, to the Jews, and to go to Rome. Do not second guess. And do not worry about possible mistakes in your past. Don't go down that road. Only be concerned about putting God first today. Christ will turn any mistakes that you have made into a